got myself some wisdom from a leather bag book got myself a savior when i took a second Opened up the pages And what did I find? A black and white portrait of a king Who's a friend of mine Funny how when you think you're right Everybody else must be wrong Till someone with fool's wisdom Somehow comes along His voice was strange and the words he said I didn't quite understand Yet I knew that he was speaking right By the leatherback book in his hand Jesus, dear friends, my name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you this day, Good Friday, tomorrow, Saturday, following day, Easter Sunday, more about that in just a moment. Until now, we have talked about RTN being the leading Christian internet, TV, and radio platform in Scotland. Unfortunately, as of the 1st of April, a very few days from now after the weekend, Scotland will no longer be a democratic country. Freedom of speech has effectively been abolished in Scotland. If you express conservative views uh, in support of traditional marriage, if you theologically challenge the dogmas of, and praxis of Islam, you can be liable for hate crime persecution. They're setting up a thousand places, safe zones of some description, where people can come in and make a complaint that they're offended by anything you say. And of course, the police will be obliged to criminally investigate. Free speech has been abolished in Scotland by the Scottish National Party, and the British Crown has done nothing about it. The British Parliament in Whitehall has done nothing about it. The House of Lords has done nothing about it. And you have a Muslim First Minister in Scotland. So unfortunately, much like Canada and much like at least the state of Victoria in Australia, we would have to say Scotland is no longer an authentically or genuinely democratic country. That is also true of Finland and various other places, but it's certainly become true now of Scotland. Free speech has been abolished. Hence, RTN will continue. And we will remain, as we have been, doctrinally, same purposes, 
same goals, same team, but we will no longer be Scotland based. We are having to relocate to platforms outside of the jurisdiction of Scotland so we can continue to express and explain the reasons for our belief in traditional marriage, our belief that Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's no option. We're very, very sorry. My speaking personally, my grandmother was was from Scotland. I've always had an emotional attachment to Scotland uh, for family reasons and things of this nature. I've always appreciated Scottish culture and literature and such things as this. But Scotland is not the Scotland that it once was. You've got a Muslim first minister. You've got people who, in the name of, of, of Robert de Bruce and William Wallace, are not Scottish nationalists. They are Scottish fascists. That's what's happened. So this will be the final time that we will identify as coming from Scotland. We will no longer be coming from Scotland. It will continue. The ministry will not change, but it will no longer be platformed, web served, hosted within the jurisdiction of Scotland. Scotland is no longer, in effect, a democracy. This is tragic, but it is a sign of what is coming to other countries. Even in the United States, despite the First Amendment, free speech is under attack, even by people in the Supreme Court. They're anti-free speech, meaning you must agree with them or you're going to be accused of hate speech. Even if it's not rooted in hatred, that's what they will call it and they will prosecute it. It is all politically motivated, and we believe it is demonically animated. Politically motivated and demonically animated. Quoting Thomas Jefferson, if people do not enslave the government, the government will enslave them. Now, there are hopeful signs. People in Argentina, Holland, and in the Republic of Ireland, ordinary working people, have risen up against the political establishment recently. I hope and pray that happens in Great Britain and that it happens in Scotland, but that is not on the horizon right now. Um, Scotland is no longer, me and my true love will never meet again on the bunny bunny shores of Loch Lomond. It's become Allahu Akbar. In effect, the equivalent of Sharia, Islamic law, where you cannot speak out in criticism of, of, of Islam is going to be the mainstay in Scotland with a Muslim first minister. Uh, they can accuse you of hate speech. You point out something objectively true. Mohammed married Aisha when she was six, took her virginity at the age of nine. Oh, you've insulted Islam. I'm offended. And this becomes the basis of a criminal prosecution. And they'll get some Islamic scholars who will try to argue against their own hadith or reinterpret it in such a way. But the decisions by the courts will be, again, politically, not juridically governed, most likely. The police are going to be forced to pursue these prosecutions, and there's nothing we can do. Goodbye, Scotland. I love Scotland. I love the believers in Scotland. But Scotland is no longer Scotland. And before long, if this continues, England will no longer be England. Wales will no longer be Wales. Canada already is no longer Canada. This is what is happening as we get closer to the return of the Lord. So, to our listeners in Scotland, please stay with us. We're not going to abandon you. But Scotland has abandoned us. It has abandoned free speech. It has abandoned democracy. It has abandoned, in effect, religious freedom uh, to express the moral convictions commensurate with your faith. The first minister is very pro-Islamic Palestinian, no friend of Israel. That will be another issue. Um, it's a tragedy. It is a tragedy what has happened in Scotland. Once a hotbed, hotbed of democracy, and free thought, no longer the case. Walter Carlyle and Robert de Bruce, this kind of thing no longer matters. 
it's got to be like the Soviet Union, censored speech, like China, censored speech, like Iran and Saudi Arabia, censored speech. This is what it has come to. Um, so we say goodbye, not to our listeners and viewers in Scotland, but we say goodbye to Scotland because Scotland has tragically said goodbye to us. There'll be further announcements along this line, but you'll see the credits identifying us as a Scottish-based platform will have to be removed or have been removed already. So this is the last time. I'm very, very, very sorry. Please pray for Scotland. Please pray for Britain. Please pray that the Lord raises his hand against these enemies of not just democracy, but religious freedom. Enough of that. We are at Good Friday, Easter Saturday, Easter Sunday. Something that always comes up this time of year that I always have to address this time of year. And so I'll do it again. In fact, in a different context concerning the eclipse of April 8th hoax, we mentioned it last week, but we'll be looking primarily at the Gospel of St. Luke, chapters 22 and 23. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 23. First of all, as we've pointed out multiple times, and I'm only saying it because it is that time of year when we need to say it again. Romans tells us, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls. One man esteems one day, one another, let each be convinced in his own mind. If you want to celebrate Good Friday or observe Good Friday today, or perhaps it was yesterday by the time you're watching this, that's no problem. If you want to celebrate the resurrection of Christ on Easter Sunday, that's no problem. Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 tells us, let no one be your judge in regard to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. When you observe these things as a matter of personal choice, personal church tradition, nobody has a problem. However, biblically and historically, we have to understand that Jesus did not die on Good Friday and he did not raise from the dead on Easter Sunday. These things happened on the 15th of the month of Nisan, also known as Aviv, spring. Right now, by the Hebrew calendar that Jesus would have followed, we're at the end of the month of Adar, just getting by the Feast of Purim, not Easter or not the Resurrection. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians all make it clear that Jesus rose from the dead the first day of the week of what we call in Hebrew, Hag Matzot, Hag Matzot, Sunday of what is popularly or colloquially referred to as Passover week, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He died at of Hag, at of Hag, the night before the, or the day before the Pas Paschal lamb was, was eaten, okay, of a Passover. Um, that's when it happened. Uh, the question that always comes up this time of year, and I know you've probably heard this before if you're one of our regular listeners, but we always have new people. How do you get three days and three nights did Jesus die on a Thursday? Did Jesus die on a... How can it be Good Friday? You need three days and three nights, like when Jonah was in the well. Where do you get the three days and the three nights? Luke 23, verses 44 and 45. My apologies to those who know this. It was now the sixth hour, verse 44, 
and darkness fell over the entire land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. When Jesus died, sinful man was no longer separated from holy God. The sun was darkened when he was on the cross. Okay. In science, almost any science, physics, chemistry, geoscience, biomedical science, biology, in statistical math and probability theorems, in forensic science, criminal investigation, anything, statistically speaking, probabilities, the odds, tell us that the simplest solution is usually the right one. Not always, but the simplest solution is usually the right one. If you have a computer systems analyst who's a troubleshooter and there's a problem in a computer system, the simplest, he's going to begin or she's going to begin looking what the simplest cause of the problem is. The simplest solution, the simplest answer is usually the right one. Detectives will tell you that that is true in criminal investigation. It's true in forensic science. It's mathematically true, demonstrably true in statistical analysis and probability theorems. It's true in all kinds of things. And it's no less true in scripture. Turn with me, please, to the book of Amos, chapter 8. Verse 9, it'll come about on that day, declares the Lord, I'll make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. I'll turn your festivals into mourning, all your songs into lamentations. I will bring sackcloth on everyone's loins and baldness on every head, and I'll make it like a time of mourning for an only son. Notice, mourning for an only son. Same as in Zechariah chapter 12. They will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over the firstborn son. And the end of it will be like a bitter day. Okay. So the Son of God will be mourned when the sun goes down at noon. As we pointed out last week, this could not possibly be an eclipse, could not possibly be an eclipse. That false teacher, and he's a very ignorant man, I don't say that to belittle him. I, J.D. Farrick in America says it was an eclipse. He says a lot of crazy things. No, it was not an eclipse. It couldn't be. It was at the wrong phase of the lunar month. It couldn't be a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse. God supernaturally intervened, making the sun go down. The Hebrew way of counting days is always based, predicated on, and derived from the creation narrative in Genesis, as we've said multiple times, or lehoshek, light to dark, light to dark. Interesting, Scotland, Scotia means dark. <laughs> Not in Hebrew, but that's what it means. Light to dark. It doesn't matter how many hours are in a day, once the sun goes down, it's counted as a day. In the book of Joshua, a day was 48 hours. In the book of Isaiah, the sun went back and the day was extended when the longevity of King Hezekiah was prolonged. In the book of Revelation, a day will be reduced in chapter 9 from 24 to 16 hours. It is always based on or the Hoshek, light to dark. Hence we read in the Synoptic Gospels, but right now we're looking at Luke 22:44. It was the sixth hour. Okay. And darkness came until the ninth hour. The sun was obscured. It didn't give its light. Now that, of course, foreshadows something that'll happen at the close of the age with the return of Christ. That happened in his first coming. It'll happen in his second coming. 
the sun and moon will not give their light. The prophecies of Jesus and the Olivet Discourse, the prophecies of the Hebrew prophet Joel, these things will happen again. They had a fulfillment in his first coming. They will have a fulfillment in his second coming. One foreshadowing the other. Okay. So, if Jesus is crucified on a Friday. They put him on the cross and it gets dark. They take him off the cross at three o'clock. It's no longer dark. Hence, you've got one day and one night. Then, as normal, the sun again sets on Friday. That begins Saturday. Okay. Saturday night, the sun goes down again. That's the third night. Sun rises Sunday morning. You've got three days and three nights. There is no problem as Hebrews counted time and as Jews, at least observant Jews, still count time. These questions began to emerge because of the adaptation by the church of the Julian and Gregorian calendars and because of something known as the quadridecimian schism where the day of the resurrection was moved from where the scripture says it is from where the New Testament emphatically and unambiguously says it is it was moved to the first Sunday after the vernal equinox which had been a pagan feast day and all of these things, Peter Cotton Tail and Easter bunnies and eggs and these, these things were pagan origin. Okay. Much the same as Father Christmas and Santa Claus <laughs> counterfeit the real Saint Nicholas and divert people's attention away from the birth of Christ at the Nativity, although we don't know the day he was born. The same thing happens in Easter with the Easter Bunny and the Easter Parade and things like this. In my native New York, I attended a church as a young believer before I immigrated to Israel. It was a famous, it's a prominent Baptist church with quite a history and quite a number of famous Bible expositors preached there over the years and decades. Um, Stephen Alford, Alan Redpath, Donald Hubbard, a number of well-known Bible expositors would speak there. Uh, presently, as far as I'm aware, the pastor is, is still a Jewish believer, uh, Pastor Epstein. I um, <clears throat> big church. In fact, they knocked it down to rebuild it now <laughs> on 57th Street across from Carnegie Hall. And I would go to this church, but on Easter Sunday, they had two services, two. Because you had people who were born-again Christians who for reasons of culture and professing to be saved evangelical Baptists would come to church at Easter or Christmas or for a rite of passage. They wouldn't attend the church every Sunday. You had a morning service and a night service, but not two morning services, except Easter, because you had people coming to church once a year. Now in New York, it is called the Easter Parade. It is a fashion show. Fifth Avenue is turned into a catwalk. And people come and they buy outfits and things like this. And women with hats and children dressed up in, in, in little girls with dresses and little boys with suits and how you dress for Easter. It becomes a fashion event, a fashion event. It's a fashion show where everybody gets to be a fashion model and they put it on TV so ordinary people can become fashion models for a day. And part of the culture is they would go to church. Now, these were people, at least in the church I went to, claimed to be saved Christians. Where were they the rest of the year? Well, this is the world we live in. And that was years ago. God knows what it's like now. Horrible. Well, quadrant to see me in schism. 
They took the day away from when the Bible says it is, Jesus fulfilling Hag Pesach and um, the Feast of First Fruit, and they put it at a different time. That was a pagan holy day. Okay. Um, and did everything to divert away from its meaning. It doesn't matter if it's the Easter parade, the New York American fashion show. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, if it's Peter Cottontail and the Easter bunny comes like Father Christmas would come and bring children chocolate uh, and baskets with chocolate eggs in it and all this kind of stuff. And children loved it. But that's what Easter was about. What am I going to get? All this candy, all this chocolate, milk chocolate, usually, for Easter. It was a big deal. But it wasn't about the resurrection of Jesus. The religious aspect was just the excuse. It was cultural. Cultural and religious, but not spiritual and theological. Well, that's it. When we understand how Jesus, in his death, fulfilled the prophecies, the Messianic prophecy of Amos chapter 8, we understand when we get the three days and three nights. Straightforward and simple. It also, in large part, reconciles the apparent discrepancies or the somewhat varied accounts of the days between John's Gospel and the Synoptic Gospels when we understand how they counted the time, this gives us a plausible basis to reconcile apparent contradictions that are not really contradictory. When we understand the Sitzim Rebbe, the original Jewish background of the New Testament text. Now, I'm only saying this because it comes up inevitably this time of year, every year, and that's the only reason I'm saying it. I've said it before, but I have to go through the ritual. It's sort of like telling little kids the nativity story at Christmas. You're just expected to do it. Oh, well, I'm expected to do it once a year, so I do it. There it is. Now, let's get on for today. The hypocrisy of hatred. What's good about Good Friday? The three trials of Jesus. Now notice there's a parody to the experience of Jesus in the book of Acts concerning Paul. Jesus told them they were whitewashed tombs. Paul said, you whitewashed wall. The high priest servant smacked Jesus. High priest servant smacks Paul. Jesus had three trials. Paul had three trials. Paul was brought before Roman authorities. Jesus was brought before Roman authorities after being indicted by rabbinic authorities. There's a parallelism between what happens to Paul and happens to Jesus. We have recorded teachings on our website, Moriel website, sorry, explaining this. But let's look now at these three trials of Jesus. The first one the trial before the Sanhedrin. Luke 22, verse 66, please. When it was day, the council of elders of people assembled, both chief priests and scribes. Now, the scribes were the academic theologians. They were the sofrim. They were the experts on the actual text. A scribe, a sofer, came from the Hebrew infinitive lispor, to count, if you don't know. The Arabs invented digits, numerals, but the digital numerals. But the Hebrews, like the Greeks, like the Romans, used letters as numbers, okay? And the accuracy of copying scrolls of the Tanakh, of the Old Testament, of the Torah, of the law, and the prophets, was done by the Sofrim by mathematical means. They knew the numerical value of every verse of every book. There were no chapters then, but they knew the numerical values of every verse of every book. And if it didn't add up to the exact amount, hypothetically, this verse has to amount to 1,116. If it came up to 1,000. 
115 or 1117, they knew there'd be an error and they would have to take a scribal knife to the parchment that was their eraser and correct it. You see the scribal knife spoken of in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 36, when they burned the scroll, okay? A scribal knife. So you had experts on the text. They were experts on the text, the Hebrew text, the Aramaic text, and the Septuagint, the Greek text. They were experts on the text. And then you had the clergy, theologians and clergy. And they led him away to their council chamber, saying, if you're the Messiah, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you won't believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they said, are you the Son of God? And he said to them, yes, I am. You have said it, literally. Then they said, what further need do we have of testimony? We've heard it ourselves. This is the first trial of Jesus. The religious trial before the Sanhedrin, held in the house or the palatial house of the high priest of Caiaphas. His relative through marriage, Ananias, was also present. Let's talk about the constituency of the Sanhedrin. High priests and scribes. The priests were Zadokites, the sons of Zadok. Ezekiel said the sons of Zadok will be the true priests because they remained faithful to God when the other priests became corrupted. Their ancestors were righteous, coming down from the time of the Maccabees, but in the Hasmonean period, in the intertestamental period, between the Old and New Testament, that 400 years approximately, in the Hasmonean period, they became corrupted. Their ancestors were right. Now, a Sadducee comes from Sadducim, Sedokim, the righteous ones, the righteous clergy. They had the name of being righteous because their forebearers in the Levitical priesthood were. In Hebrew, to be correct means tzodek, tzodek, atat tzodek, you are correct in what you say. A righteous person is a tzaddik, tzaddik, tzodek, correct, right, tzaddik, righteous. In biblical Hebrew thought, you cannot be righteous unless you are right. If what you believe is false, you cannot be righteous. This nonsense, well, he may have wrong doctrine, but he's a good brother, he's right. No, he's not. If somebody teaches error, they are not righteous. You cannot be a tzaddik unless you are tzaddik. The original tzaddikim, sons of Zadok, that family of the Levitical priesthood, descendants of Aaron, were righteous but became corrupted. They became involved in anti-supernatural or anti-supernatural rationalism. They denied the resurrection. They denied the miraculous. They denied the angelic. Religion to them was religion. It was not a true faith. They didn't believe in the supernatural dimension of the faith, per se. They denied the resurrection. They were not tzaddikim, because they were not tzodek. They were not righteous ones. They had the name of being righteous, but they weren't. These people controlled the priesthood. They controlled the Levitical priesthood. They are the equivalent of modern theological liberals, but they control the priesthood. Opposed to them 
were the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the Prushim. Their name comes from the Hebrew word to interpret and to publish. Le forsem, le forsem, proshim, okay, to publish. They were the interpreters of the scripture. Le faresh, le, le forsim, proshim, the Pharisees. They were much more conservative doctrinally, much more than the Sadducees. They believed in a resurrection. They believed in angels. They believed in the supernatural. They took the scriptures quite literally. And they saw the Sadducees as heretical. They would look upon the Sadducees in much the same way as conservative evangelicals would look upon liberal higher critics who hold the form of religion but deny the power therein. Okay? Um, they just, you know, the, the people who will go with same-sex marriages in the church and things like this um, are opposed by the ones who are more conservative and don't agree with it. And uh, we don't believe there's a literal resurrection. You don't have to believe that to be a Christian. Uh, they would say, the Bishop of York said that when he became the Bishop of York. You don't have to believe in the resurrection of the virgin birth. And the next day, lightning struck York Minister Cathedral and set it alight. Uh, I believe that was God's judgment on the Church of England, appointing the second highest man in the Anglican clergy who, who didn't believe. But you got a conflict between those who do and those who don't. Doctrinally, the Pharisees were much better than the Sadducees. However, they were lovers of money, and like the Sadducees, and like the Herodians and the other sects, they used religion to attain political power. They used religion for political purposes, and they used politics to get religious power. The Sadducees would even at times collaborate with the Romans somewhat. Not as much as the Herodians did, but somewhat. In order to get religious power and civil and political influence. So you had these Pharisees. They were lovers of money, Jesus said, but their problem was the Torah be'al pei, the oral law, which later became codified in Talmudic writings. The Sadducees did not believe in the oral law. They believed only in the Torah, except they didn't take the Torah to be literally true or supernatural. That was the conflict. So, what you had was the Sadducees taking away from the Word of God, subtracting its supernatural character and meaning, and the Pharisees would add to it. The Pharisees would add to it. Among the Pharisees, there were people who were followers of Jesus initially secretly. Obviously, Nicodemus would have been one of them. We cannot say he was a believer, but we see in the book of Acts chapter 5, Rabbi Gamaliel, said that if Jesus was not the Messiah, Christianity or the belief in Jesus would disappear, pointing out that there were other false messiahs in Acts chapter 5. Rabbi Gamaliel took a somewhat more fair view of Jews who believed in Jesus. And what the Mishnah says about Rabbi Gamaliel is very, very interesting. It says when he died, righteousness perished from the earth. He was such a righteous man. Now, Rabbi Gamaliel was the tutor of St. Paul. He was the tutor of St. Paul, Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus. So you have Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, a persecutor of, of Jewish Christians, becomes a believer. 
Nicodemus. And we're told in the book of Acts, even that and in the New Testament, even many of the Pharisees believed in him. Many. By the time of Bar Kokhba's rebellion in 120 AD in the second century, it is estimated by Jewish historians like Max Demont that probably at least 25% of the Jews in Jerusalem believed Jesus was the Messiah. 25% in the second century before the rebellion of Bar Kokhba. And a number of these that came from the Pharisees. <clears throat> well, the Pharisees, however, <laughs> had two rival schools. The school of Shammai, which was much more legalistic, and the school of Hillel, that Rabbi Akiva and St. Paul came from. The school of Hillel was much I wouldn't say more liberal, but more tolerant. And they saw a place for the proselytization of non-Jews, um, Gentile God-fearers. So they were more amicable to non-Jews believing in the Jewish God. <clears throat> they did not take the Stoic anti-Gentile view that was predominant among the school of Shammai. But they were rivals. They didn't particularly like each other. So even within the Pharisees, the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel were not friends. But both of them, all Pharisees, both the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel, were opponents, vehement opponents, <coughs> of the Sadducees who they considered to be apostate liberal heretics in modern terms. So you have this opposition between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They virtually despised each other. And even within the Pharisees, the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel were rivals. They didn't particularly like each other. They didn't get along, although it was not the same kind of hostility that they had towards the Sanhedrin, uh, to, towards the uh, Sadducees within the Sanhedrin. Now, let's understand this. Jesus and Paul would both get them arguing with each other. Paul did it. I'm on trial because I believe in the resurrection knowing the Sadducees didn't, and the Pharisees did, and Paul says, I'm a Pharisee. I'm from the school of Hillel. I was trained by Rabbi Gamaliel. Rabbi Ankrios was my classmate. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai was my classmate. Um, and I believe in the resurrection. A Pharisee of the Pharisees. Okay. And he did this when they tried to nail him in Jerusalem he got the Sadducees and Pharisees fighting with each other. Jesus did the same thing. He played the resurrection card, and he would get the Sadducees and Pharisees arguing and fighting with each other. They despised each other. So you have a kind of division within the Pharisees themselves, but a hostile schism between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. There were other peripheral groups, such as the Essenes, but they're not pertinent to what we're looking at at the moment. We have other teachings explaining it. Now, although the Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't like each other, in fact, some of the Pharisees didn't like the other Pharisees. They stuck together against Jesus. They stuck together against Yeshua. In 
individual Pharisees like Nicodemus not. But the mainstream, as much as they hated the Sanhedrin being controlled by the Sadducees, they would still stick with them. They didn't like the Sanhedrin having the Sadducees controlling the temple and the high priesthood. Yet, they still stuck with them against Jesus. As much as they disliked, even hated each other, they hated Jesus, their Messiah, more. Not all of them, but certainly the mainstream leadership. Let's move on. They didn't like each other. Even the Sadducees didn't like the Pharisees, and the Pharisees didn't like the Sadducees, and the rival sects of the Pharisees didn't get along. The only thing they could agree on is they hated their Messiah more than they hated each other. Now, my family are Israeli Jews who believe in Jesus. I love Israel. I love the Jewish people. Jews who believe in Jesus are the natural branches of the church. Anti-Semitism is satanic. God has a prophetic purpose for Israel and the Jews. The maltreatment of Israel in the international arena for defending itself from radical Islam is morally abominable. I'm pro-Zionist. I believe the reestablishment of Israel fulfills biblical prophecy. And I believe, as the New Testament teaches, the Jews remain beloved for the sake of their avot, their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as Paul wrote in the book of Romans, chapter 11. I believe all of that. But I also believe that Talmudic Judaism is not the Judaism of Scripture. There's no temple, no high priesthood, no sacrifices. It is a man-made religion claiming to be Judaism, but it's only rabbinism. Now, I'm not singling out the Jews. I would argue that liberal Protestantism, I would argue Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, similarly, are not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity was a Judaic faith. I don't necessarily mean culturally, but theologically and spiritually, it was a Judaic faith. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Replacement theology, supersessionism, completely unscriptural. <clears throat> Much the same as the rabbis corrupted Judaism, the church fathers, particularly the post nicene church fathers, the popes, and later on, to a degree, Protestant figures corrupted Christianity. It is not biblical Christianity, most of what you see. And most of what you see is not biblical Judaism. The true Judaism is that Judaism fulfilled in the Messiah. Nonetheless, the first trial of Jesus was the religious trial before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, however, had certain legal abilities permitted by the Romans to apply punitive sentencing, but not capital sentencing. That had to come from Imperial Rome. The Sanhedrin could not capitally sentence anybody. So the first trial of Jesus was the religious one before the Sanhedrin, where the religious factions who didn't like each other formed a temporary alliance against their Messiah. That's his first trial, the religious trial, before the Sanhedrin. Let's look at the second trial. before Pilate. 
the whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate and began to accuse him, verse 1 of chapter 23, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Notice they're trying to appeal to the concerns of the Romans. Just hypocrisy. They hated the Romans. They hated Caesar. They were betrayed by the Romans. When the General Pompey entered Jerusalem and they made a treaty with Rome that Rome was to be the imperial power that would protect them. <coughs> they found themselves not a protectorate, but rather a colony. Pompey enters the Holy of Holies. As we pointed out, when anyone other than the high priest on the Day of Atonement does that, it's a type of the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation. <coughs> they hated the emperor. They lied about Jesus. Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. This guy is saying, don't pay your taxes to Rome. That was a lie. Religious liars. Islam has the doctrine of taqwit, permissible lying. The Jehovah's Witness cult allows permissible lying to defend the cult and to get people to join it. I have watched many times Roman Catholic apologists on the internet, and these people lie. They just lie repeatedly. Religious liars. It's not just the Sanhedrin. It's been done in Christendom. It's been done by cults. It's done by Islam. They began to accuse him. He's misleading our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to Caesar. So Pilate asked him, saying, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, it is as you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, well, I don't care if he's the king of the Jews, as long as he's not against Rome. I find no guilt in this man. But they kept insisting, saying, he stirs up the people teaching all over Judea starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. <clears throat> Rome was always afraid of a Jewish uprising, which would eventually come in 68 AD and climax in 70 AD, and then happen again in the second century with Bar Kokhba and Rabbi Akiva. The Romans always wanted to keep the peace. They didn't want rebellion. Notice they kept playing the songs that would annoy the Romans the most, that would put fear into the Romans. This guy's making trouble. Now, remember, the Romans had crucified thousands, thousands of Jews for sedition. Thousands. But they kept insisting. He stirs up the people. When Pilate heard it, he asked whether he was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself was also in Jerusalem at the time. Herod's palace would have been near, adjacent to the modern Jaffa Gate in the old city of Jerusalem. The Romans had Judea, northern Israel, where the ten tribes had been, and the area around the Sea of Galilee was Galilee. When Herod the Great died, the prophecy of Jacob in Genesis 49 concerning the tribe of Judah was fulfilled. The scepter, the 
authority, political authority. The scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Shiloh meaning the one who was sent, which the rabbis agree is a metaphor for the Messiah. The scepter would not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Once Jesus came, there was not a Herodian king in Judah anymore. The Romans moved the capital from Jerusalem to Caesarea Maritina on the coast. That's where Pilate's headquarters was. They would come to the fortress Antonio in Rome on certain occasions. Herod was the descendant of Herod the Great. Once Jesus came, the scepter departed from Judah. The Romans sent a procurator. They sent a Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Herod the Great was an Idumean. He was of ethnic Arab descent. But his religion was Jewish by way of popular convenience. But culturally and politically, he was a Roman, a European. The Romans considered him to be a Roman. He's a major type of the Antichrist. To the Jews, he'll be a Jew. To the Arabs, an Arab. To the West, he'll be a European, a Westerner. He'll be able to bamboozle everybody to make everybody think I'm one of you. It is on this basis, almost certainly, the Antichrist will be able to broker a false peace in the Middle East, but I digress. So the Herodians have lost control of Judea and they're angry about it. Now it has direct rule from Rome via the, well, the Roman governor, the procurator, Pontius Pilate. Herod is up in Judea, Galilee. I'm sorry, not in Judea. He's in Galilee. And because it's Passover, he comes to his palace in Jerusalem. The family, the Herodians kept the family home, as it were, in Jerusalem to come there for the pilgrim feasts. But their seat of political power now was restricted to the north, the Galilee. The Roman governor, ruling from Caesarea, ruled Judea, including Jerusalem. So at this feast, in the Herodian palace, Herod comes down from Galilee, and Pilate comes from Caesarea, and they're all there at Passover. Pilate... <clears throat> knew they were trying to frame Jesus. He says he's a Galilean. <coughs> his king is not me, or his governor is not me. He's answerable to the government. government that is a Roman subsidiary government of Herod in Galilee. So we have the second trial of Jesus, <clears throat> which in terms of modern jurisprudence might be described as a combination of a trial and a jurisdiction hearing to see who has jurisdiction over what was fast becoming a capital case. Pilate in Judea, the Roman, or Herod, the Galilean king. Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus. He'd wanted to see him for a long time because he'd been hearing about him and hoping to see some sign performed by him and questioned him at some length, but he answered him nothing. 
the chief priests and the scribes, that's the Sanhedrin, were standing there accusing him vehemently. Now they hated the Romans. But they were willing to say, we have no king but Caesar. They hated Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. They will choose him over their Messiah. This again foreshadows the fact that the Roman emperors became deified very often, beginning with Caesar Augustus. Other emperors were deified posthumously. And they'll follow Antichrist instead of Christ. What happens here, again, hints, foreshadows what will happen in the future. Pilate saw him. He wanted to see a show, a magic show. He wanted to see miracles. Jesus wouldn't answer. Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Putting him in the gorgeous robe was like royal vestment, dressing him up like royalty to mock him. Now, Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day, for before they had been enemies with each other. So let's recap this. The school of Hillel Pharisees and the school of Shammai Pharisees didn't like each other. But neither of them liked the Sanhedrin. They detested them. And the Sanhedrin detested the Pharisees. They all detested each other, but they stuck together united against Jesus. Both Sadducees and Pharisees hated the Romans, but they stuck together with the Romans against Jesus. The Herodians, who were Jewish Romans, basically, Herod and Pilate were enemies. They were against each other. They hated each other. But they stuck together against Jesus. <clears throat> Pharisees didn't like each other. Pharisees and Sadducees didn't like each other. Stuck together against Jesus. Sadducees and Pharisees hated the Romans, but stuck together with the Romans against Jesus. Herod and Pilate, the Herodians and the Romans, didn't like each other, but they stuck together against Jesus. Amazing. Look with me, please, if you will to the book of Acts. Chapter four. Peter gives his second recorded kerygma. 
after Pentecost, which is the first one. Quoting from the Psalms in verse 25. <clears throat> Who by the spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, why did the Gentiles rage, the nations, and the people devise futile things? Of course, we're familiar with this in Christian hymnody from Handel's Messiah. The king of the earth, the kings of the earth, took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For truly in this city, Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, Yeshua, whom you anointed. Oh, boy. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Notice, it was Jews and non-Jews. It was the Herodians and the Romans. All united against the Lord and his anointed. In fulfillment of the prophecies expressed poetically in the Psalms, why did the Gentiles rage? Why did they take counsel against the Lord and his Messiah? Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people, against your holy servant Jesus. They didn't like each other. They even hated each other. They were rivals for power, for influence, for money, for religious control, for political control. They were rivals in every sense. But they stuck together against Jesus. Finally, back to Pilate. This was sentencing. Pilate was trying to get him off the hook. Herod couldn't find anything in verse 15 of Luke 23. I can't find anything. Pilate wanted to have him flogged and let him go. But they cried together away with this man, give us Barabbas, you know the story. Pilate wanted to get him off the hook. And he said a third time, why, what evil has this man done? Now, Herod could have gotten him off the hook, put on a show. Let me see some miracles. Jesus refused. As we always point out, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. Usually when Jesus healed somebody, he would say, don't tell anybody. Or if it was something required to tell the high priest, like leprosy, show yourself to the high priest as a testimony. You don't tell me. Jesus had miracles and he had healings. But he never had a healing crusade or a miracle crusade. He had a repentance crusade. These signs follow. Be very careful of the latter-day Herods, the word faith money preachers, with their miracle crusades and their healing crusades. I believe in healing and I believe in miracles. I just don't believe most of what we see today is authentic. And too much of what we see today are religious con artists. Jesus never allowed signs, wonders, miracles, or healings to be the focus of his message or his ministry. It was always salvation, repentance, and faith. So he wouldn't put on the show for Herod. He lost that trial. Now he appears for, ex for sentencing, which would be execution. They were insistent. 
he'd be crucified. Again, the Romans crucified thousands of Jews <clears throat> before and after this time. And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. Notice the sentence was passed against Jesus, not for any legal or juridical reason, but for political reasons. It was a politically motivated trial. It's only my opinion, though many people I know agree. I was just in my native New York. Donald Trump had a valuation on his property that he put up as collateral in Florida, Mar-a-Lago, to secure loans from Deutsche Bank, the American subsidiary of the German banking corporation, <clears throat> for construction projects. The bank did due diligence. They accepted the collateral and its value. <clears throat> they got their money back with interest. There was no victim. He borrowed the money. He put our property as collateral. Deutsche Bank accepted the value of the collateral. The project was completed. They got paid back with interest. They were happy. No crime. Nothing. But a corrupt prosecutor who says she ran for political office to get Trump. She's a black racist. The same as you have white racists who hate blacks, you have black racists who hate white people. She's a black racist. She said Trump overvalued Mar-a-Lago to get the loan. Well, that's for the bank to determine. The judge agrees, who's a liberal left-wing judge, and they find Trump over a half billion dollars un for a crime that never happened. He contests it and has to put up a bond. Politically driven justice, all political, nothing to do with any crime, no victim, no fraud. Everybody got paid, everybody made money, everybody was happy. Invented charges that were politically motivated. Again, I'm not here preaching politically. I'm simply making, trying to explain what happened to Jesus in light of what we see today. Politically motivated justice, except that it's not justice. It is a corruption of jurisprudence. Herod and Pilate, by both Roman and Jewish law, innocent. I recall on the 1970s, Haim Cohen, who had been president of the Israeli Supreme Court, the Israeli equivalent of the Chief Justice of the United States, conducted a judicial inquiry of legal scholars into the trials of Jesus. And the Israeli Supreme Court, the president of the Israeli Supreme Court, with these scholars, Jewish and non-Jewish, said the trial of Jesus was illegal by both Roman and Jewish law, and he never should have been sentenced. This was the Israeli Supreme Court, the president of the Israeli Supreme Court. It was politically motivated. Politically motivated trial. <clears throat> Jesus said, what they do to me, they will do to you. If they hate me, they'll hate you also. A servant is not above his master. Politically motivated persecutions. Always dual standards. You see people like Hunter Biden and... The, the, Hillary Clinton not being prosecuted for the same things <clears throat> Mr. Trump is being prosecuted. And I'm not campaigning for Donald Trump. I'm simply stating facts. 
There's two standards. It's politically driven justice. We did a teaching a number of years ago on the third chapter of Daniel. We will not find any way to accuse Daniel unless we do it on the basis of his beliefs. And so they set up a means to get laws on the books in order to nail Daniel and the Hebrews. Okay. We're not going to get anything on him unless we get it with respect to his beliefs. Well, that's what happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They simply get the law on the books. Once the law is on the books, then they selectively enforce it against the people of God. They get laws on the books that appear innocuous, and then they selectively enforce it against the people of God, against the children of God also against the church of Jesus Christ. Just get the law on the books. And then for political reasons, we will prosecute. This is what is happening in Scotland. They have set up a thousand places where people can go if they feel they've been offended and make a complaint that they've been offended in Scotland. Some of these are in things like sex shops. You can go to a sex shop and say, I was offended because somebody spoke out and said same-sex marriage was wrong in their opinion. Oh, we'll call the police. We're so sorry what happened. A thousand places, a thousand in Scotland, set up for this purpose. Now, you know very well, nobody is going to be going after radical Muslims much. What you had in Scotland where Muslim physicians, medical doctors, tried to blow up Glasgow Airport. Fortunately, they were intercepted and apprehended. Lockerbie, Muslims hijack an airplane and crash it into a village. In Strathclyde, these things have happened. But Scotland has a Muslim first minister. You say you don't believe in Islam, and here's why. I'm offended. He said Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to God the Father but through me. You're saying that my religion is not as good as yours? I'm offended. This is a hate crime. And again, they've set these so-called, whatever you want to call them, safe zones for people who feel offended to go and make a complaint, and the police are by law obliged. I guarantee you, you're not going to see many homosexuals prosecuted for what they say about Christians. You're not going to see many Muslims prosecuted for what they say about Christianity. They're going to come after Christians who believe in traditional marriage, and who don't believe in the Koran. Just like Daniel. We're only going to get him, nail him, if we get him on the basis of his beliefs. Just get the laws on the books. Once the laws are there, with political motive, we'll come after them. <laughs> People who hate each other. Let's just look at the present situation in Gaza. The Saudi Arabians 
have killed maybe 400,000 Houthis. Because the Houthis are surrogates of the Iranians. Nobody in the United Nations said anything. 400,000 Muslims killed by other Muslims. A bloodbath in Yemen. Say nothing about it. By some estimates, the Assad regime in Syria, backed by Russia and Iran, has killed 700,000 Arab Muslims and driven most of the Syrian Christians out of Syria, out of Aleppo and Damascus. 700,000! Do you see UN resolutions and protests in the streets of London and New York against the Assad regime? No. They hate each other. Iran, Persia is Shiite. They hate the Sunnis. The Saudi Arabians, the Salafis are Sunni. They hate the Shiites. You had a war in Gaza between Fatah, Yasser Arafat's faction that runs the Palestinian Authority, and Hamas. They killed 8,000 of each other. Did anybody say anything? Was the United Nations passing Security Council resolutions? No! They genocidally exterminate each other. 1.5 million people killed in the war between Iran and Iraq in the 1980s. 1.5 million. Hundreds of thousands killed in Yemen. Nearly three quarters of a million killed in Syria. Lebanon, the same. Disaster after disaster. The war in Gaza between Fatah and Hamas, the same. Nobody says anything. But if Israel, after an existing peace treaty or ceasefire was broken on October 7th of last year, and 1,400 Israelis are killed and babies in cribs are beheaded, and little girls are raped by Muslim gangs, and people are abducted and held hostage, and the Israelis fight back, the world is up in arms. What about the 700,000 dead in Syria or the 400,000 dead in Yemen? Nobody cares, all hypocrisy. United Nations couldn't care less. United nothing. Well, let's look now. <clears throat> Muslims hate feminists. Women are flogged in Muslim countries. There's arranged marriages that are forced. Since Biden gave Afghanistan back to the Taliban, go watch the clips. I watched one of a little girl, nine years old, being forced to marry a 70-year-old who purchased her from her family. Another little girl was forced to marry a 55-year-old. <clears throat> These are little girls, eight and nine. Now, as of Monday, if I say this, somebody in Scotland can say they're offended and the police will come and knocking on my door and I could be arrested. Nobody says anything. Al-Qaeda hates the Taliban. Taliban hates Al-Qaeda. Iran 
hates the Saudis, the Saudis hate the Iranians. They hate each other. But they'll stick together against Israel. Let's look at the political left in Great Britain and the United States. Muslims hate feminists. Yet, the political left will pander to both of them. They will unite against Christians. The feminists, the pro-abortion, and the purveyors of Sharia being brought to Western countries, left-wing political parties will pander to both of them. in the USA, in the UK, and elsewhere. They hate each other. You know what happens to women under Islam, under the Sharia? But the Labour Party, the Scottish National Party, the American Democratic Party, the squad, so-called in Washington, oh, they'll stick together <laughs> against Christians. And against Jews, increasingly. They don't even like each other. Homosexuals and women. There's something called Title IX in America. Feminists, women's rights organizations are objecting to biological males being able to compete in sports against biological women despite having a natural orthomuscular advantage making it unfair. Women, even young girls, even underage girls being forced by law to share locker, laboratory, and shower facilities with men claiming to be women, transgender. The women's rights movements don't like these homosexual campaigns to push their agenda. They don't like each other. But the feminists, the pro-abortion, and the pro-same-sex marriage, transgender, they'll both vote for Biden They'll vote, vote for the Labour Party or the SNP or any left wing. They'll stick together against those who uphold what the scripture teaches about sexual identity. They hate each other! But they hate us more. Why? Same reason the Sanhedrin the Pharisees and Sadducees hated each other, but they hated Jesus more. The Herodians and Romans hated each other, but they hated Jesus more. The Jews and the Romans hated each other, but the, rabbi, the rabbinic establishment and the Romans hated Jesus more. A servant is not above his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. These people hate each other. But they hate Christians more because Christians are the body of Christ. And then finally, as the scriptures tell us, they'll turn against Israel and the Jews. We're seeing it. What is good about Good Friday? The hypocrisy of their hatred. They hate each other. But they're willing to unite against Jesus Christ and those who follow him. That's the way it was on Good Friday. And that's the way it is on this Good Friday. So I ask you, 
Yes, Jesus atoned for our sins. Yes, I am not going to hell because he died in my place. Yes, he rose from the dead. All of that is true, praise God. That's what makes it good for me. But what makes it good for society? They hate each other. They even hate themselves. But they hate Jesus more. And they hate those who follow Jesus more. What is good about Good Friday? Thank you so much for listening. God bless. I see.